minister gets louder and more emphatic. Where is God? The eight-year-old Elizabeth would say, the minister starts shaking his finger in the kid's face. Where is God? The kid runs out of the office. He runs home. And he finds his 10-year-old brother. He says, we're in trouble now. God is missing and they think we did it. <laughs> So, where's the... There's a slide switch on the side. Push the way down. There's some technology going on. Remember when uh, Kenji and Jennifer were going to go on this trip last year to California? And for some reason, they didn't have cell phones with them. And Kenny was all worried. What would happen if we break down? And I was never, when I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones. We just had coin phones, paper phones. Huh? We get used to this stuff. So the first unity principle says there's one power and one presence active as my life in the universe. God would be omnipotent. Well, that's, that sounds good. But it still kind of begs the question what's God? You know, we talk about God a lot, but it means different things to different people. There's an old Jain story that talks about six blind men that were asked to determine what an elephant looked like just by feeling it up. And the blind man who felt the leg said the elephant is like a pillar. And the one who felt the tail said the elephant is like a rope. The one who felt the trunk said the elephant is like a tree branch. The one who felt the ear said the elephant is like a hand fan, and the one who felt the belly said the elephant is like a wall, and lastly, the one who felt the tusk said the elephant is like a solid pipe. And the king told them, all of you are right. The reason each of you is telling it differently is because each of you touched a different part of the elephant. So actually, the elephant has all the things that you mentioned. This reminds me a lot of all the different religious and spiritual beliefs in the world. I mean, there's all these different religions and sects and variations. There's the Southern Baptists and the other Baptists and all these different kinds of Methodists and, and the Unitarians and the Unity people and the Religious Science people. And, you know, I go to a Religious Science Church and Unity Church, the, the, the words are a little bit different, but the concepts are really similar, but yet we think that we don't belong together. Um, and you know, it also reminds me of, of all the religions that don't exist anymore, like the Greek gods. Where do they all go? Are they in a, a god rest home somewhere? <laughs> or, or the pharaohs worship the sun god? And I wonder if 2,000 years from now people will look at our stuff as quaint I don't know. So there's all these different beliefs. And if you look historically, am I, am I moving too much? So God is often could see with this supernatural creator that kind of looks down from the clouds and watches over all of us. I kind of grew up, I was raised in a Jewish family and I kind of had this guy idea of God was an old white guy in heaven looking down at us and wearing a bathrobe. And sometimes he would kill people, you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah, he'd flood the planet. And if he got mad at you, you really didn't want him mad at you. Uh, he told Abraham to kill his son. They said, never mind. He would tell people what to do, the Ten Commandments, and get really upset if they didn't do it. And he said, get help. He didn't do what he said. Burn. Yeah. And God was responsible for all the good and bad things that happened in the world, and we had to pray to him so the bad things didn't happen to us. I remember when Hurricane Katrina came, and there were some people who believed that God sent that to the United States to punish us for the sins of the United States. Uh, and there are a lot of people out there who get on TV today and say, you know, God is punishing us for this, that, and the other thing. And then there are some people who believe that God decides before you're born whether you're going to heaven or hell, and there's nothing you can do to change that. You know, the, the idea of the electing is the Calvinist. Um, or people would say when bad things happen, we observed it because we had sinned and we got angry, or somehow it was part of God's plan and we just couldn't understand. And, and you know, this view of God is just not very appealing to me. Uh, 
kind of feels like I'm the blind person by the elephant's butt saying that the elephant doesn't smell good. <laughs> The God that killed people was in the Old Testament. The New Testament has a sort of different view of God. In fact, there, are, there was a sect of early Christians, really interesting, I, I like reading about early Christian history, there's all these different sects of Christianity in the beginning before the Bible got written. It's an interesting story, I don't know how many of you know how the Bible got written. There was a council in 363, I think it was. That was right after the Roman Emperor converted to Christianity and made Christianity the official Roman religion. And they had this council, and they said, okay, because the, most of the books of the Bible were written one to 200 years after Christ died. And there was a lot more books than are in the Bible today, and they kind of went through, this one's in, this one's out, this one's in, this one's out, just based on what their beliefs were at the time. But anyway, there's a sect of early Christians that believed that there were two gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, and that Jesus was sent to save the world from the God of the Old Testament. And I can see why you might say that. You look at the Old Testament, it's God, you know, really want to uh, take care of it. In fact, the old, the, I know how many, there's a, used to be a temple in Jerusalem that the Wailing Wall is now the last remaining wall of. And uh, the Romans destroyed it, I think, in 63 AD. And the Jews built this temple to keep God happy. They would sacrifice animals to God. That was the main purpose of the temple, to keep God happy. And you can see it didn't work really well for the Jews. So, there's a lot in the Bible that doesn't resonate with me. However, I came on a quote I like. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I like that. And, and thinking of God as being synonymous with love resonates with me much better than some old white guy in heaven who's kind of looking down at us. There's another book I really like called The Course in Miracles. And it talks about that the Course in Miracles is a required course, but only the time you take it is voluntary. The free will doesn't mean you can establish the curriculum, it only means you can elect what you want to take at a given time. You get to make mistakes, you get to feel pain, you can choose to suffer, and you can choose not to. And there's a, a Buddhist expression that goes something like, pain is required, suffering is optional. <laughs> that life is hard, pain is part of life, but when we resist that pain, that's when we suffer. And as much as love feels good to me, I still feel pain. I still have trouble in my relationships, I get depressed sometimes, and I always enjoy. I had a really hard day yesterday, actually. And does that mean that I'm messed up and that love or God is not in my life? The Course in Miracles tells me otherwise. It tells me that all of these difficulties are part of the grand design. That there's this, this like going around the Monopoly board. We're guaranteed to pass go. We're guaranteed to collect $200. It's just a matter of how long we want to take to go around the board. Uh, I have an infinite amount of time to learn what I need to learn. And I can take as many detours as I want. I'm guaranteed to get to the end. Which is really what I, where I started, because the Course in Miracles calls itself a journey without distance. It means that we're already there. We already are what we seek to become. We just don't know it. We have to go on this journey. It's kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You know, she was having a dream, and, and she finally gets it at the end, clicks her heels three times, and goes home. And really, she was always in Kansas all the time. There's a great movie, I don't know if any of you have seen it, called Defending Your Life. It has uh, Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep came out in the 90s. It's about this guy who dies early in the movie, and he goes to Judgment City. And in Judgment City, he's put on trial to see whether or not he's learned to give up fear. And they have all these videotapes, they videotape his whole life, and they have all these times when he was in fear. He gets to go to the past lives pavilion and see all the way that he was fearful in past lives. And if he's learned to give up fear, he gets to go on to the next thing. You know what type of that is. And if not, you get to go back and do it again. And and some people just keep going back and back. And I, and I believe that that's why we're here, to learn to give up fear. So we're going to do a song for you now that's kind of called The Grand Design. It's about just that, the Grand Design.
So the Course in Miracles also says that it doesn't mean aim to teach the meaning of love because that cannot be taught. It does aim to remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is our natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear. But what is all encompassing can have no opposite. So the Course sums it up that nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. And herein lies the peace of God. This tells me that at my core, I'm a creature of love. And that's all that's real. That's where my peace is. And out of this peace can come moments of joy. And everything that's not coming out of love is something that I invented, something that I made up. And, and I, I tell you, when I was a, a teenager in my 20s, I was an atheist because I had come to the conclusion that God was a jerk. I looked at the world. They tell me that God created the world. So why would I want to be interested in God? Because if God existed, the world was pretty messed up. But then I, uh, I got really depressed when I was uh, in my late 30s. I actually went to a mental institution for six weeks for depression. And when I came out, the psychologist handed me a course in miracles and said, do this. <laughs> and then it kind of made sense to me. You know, I made all this stuff up. You know, if, if, if the world wasn't about God, that was our, our deal. So where does that leave us? So maybe for me, rewriting the first unity principle is there's only one power and presence active in my life, active in my life as the universe love, the good and omnipotent. That love cannot be threatened. There's the only thing that is real. So that leaves me that God is love. We're love. And indeed, we're all part of God. In fact, sometimes when I meditate, I, I, set up, I substitute for God peace or love or you know that inner uh, serenity in me. I, I, I'm a social worker. I do therapy, counseling, and sometimes I'll do hypnosis with people. And I'll have them imagine being about 50 feet under the water of the ocean. But I don't know if any of you are a scuba diver. But no matter how many waves there are in the ocean, if you go about 50 feet down, it's always calm. It could be a hurricane up there. It's dead calm 50 feet down. And uh, I love scuba diving. I don't do it enough. And there's that inner peace in us. That, that to me, that's what God is. And, and I don't really know exactly what God is. There's a story that I heard Wayne Dyer tell about these two twin fetuses arguing in the womb. And one is saying to the other one, will you stop talking about life after birth? <laughs> We know that no one has ever come back from that birth canal. Once you go down that birth canal, it's over. And what is this mother that you keep talking about that loves us and protects us? I've never seen a mother. Have you seen a mother? So just go in back in your corner and suck your thumb. So I think I know about as much about what God is as a fetus knows about the world. It, it, there's something out there, I don't know what it is, I just know that when I think about the inner peace inside of me, that I feel peaceful, and that's all I need to know. And that we're spiritual beings choosing to have a human experience. So if that's the case, how come I'm not walking around in bliss all the time? How come I'm not a bliss ninny? <laughs> I have clients who smoke four or five bowls of pot a day, and they're, they're pretty blissed out. <laughs> but they're not very happy. Yeah. They're not very happy. They're just more numb. And I believe it's because I filled my mind with crap. With illusions of drama. Who said what to who, and who's doing it to me, and who's not doing it to me, and all that stuff. 
lack of suffering, lack of, I, I agree with all this. Like a soap opera, you know, people seem to really be addicted to drama. Mm -hmm. When you go to the supermarket, there's always tabloids about who's cheating on who, and, 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 and the Pope is still alive in Argentina, or Elvis is still alive in Argentina, the Pope is an alien. People, <laughs> people like drama. And I, I certainly like drama. I used to say the reason I came down from heaven is because I was bored. Heaven is boring. I want a drama. <laughs> So I believe that diamonds, that we're like diamonds. You know, diamonds are indestructible. You, you can't really do anything to them. You can cover them up, but you can't really hurt them. And I think that we're all diamonds. And we've been covered in manure. You know, we've created all this stuff. And diamonds, like our essential cells, are indestructible and beautiful. So if you cover a diamond manure, it looks pretty smelly. It looks like mud. But if you wash it off, it's still there. And I think that in order to get in touch with our essential God selves, with the love and serenity at our core, we just have to let go of all that manure that we stuff into our brains. And I think that that's our natural state. You know, sometimes, and I wish I could remember this more, is when I don't feel very good, I just feel like I'm just in denial. If I'm not enjoying, I'm in denial. And, and I, I forget that a lot of the time. And Sometimes that every day, you know, that's what I think my meditation is. I try to meditate in the morning and at night. It's kind of me flushing my brain out, but it still fills up pretty quick. So we're going to do another song about becoming empty. About letting go of all the drama and all the pain. And it's kind of like, a, think of it as a meditation. And I encourage you during this time to think about what you're holding on to. And whether you're willing to let it go in order to experience your true self. And then after the song, we're, we're going to start singing Alleluia, and you can join in, and that will complete the meditation. Uh, by the way, the last song, Grand Design, was by Craig Tamlin, first song, Dan Lima. This is another Dan Lima song. We hope to write our own music. And now we have lots of great choices out there that we miss. So just settle in and take a nice deep breath. Feel your, your beauty. Your beauty. You're all so beautiful. As you listen to this song, let it just take you deeper into the beauty of yourself and in your emptiness, which is also fullness.
according to the grace of God. And you may know this song, you may not, but we're going to uh, teach it to you if you don't. It's by Karen Jordan. And I suspect you're going to love it. You guys have to sing. So let's all stand.